Well, Merry Christmas from Rapidly Aging Technology. I'm sure I can move this computer out of the way and do a new computer video because I'm sure that it's probably done updating Vista, especially since I switched to the uh, offline updater to pull all the updates that we've been trying to pull for a while. Let's, let's take a ch peek and see how far it is. Uh, oh. Oh no. Oh. Well, if I can't do something with computers, because that's still figuring itself out and I'm not sure what to do, then we can do something about the most mechanical keyboard in existence. Welcome to another episode of Rapidly Aging Technology. Today we're going to be talking about technology that has rapidly aged, aged into almost obsolescence, a typewriter, and particularly my Remington Number no. 10 typewriter. This is a full-size desktop battleship that was the mainstay of offices everywhere. It's made, one of its big competitors would have been the um, Underwood number no. five, which I also have. Um, however, this is a particularly late example of Remington number no. 10. And we're going to take a gander around it and take a look at some of the features. I'm not sure how well you can see that badge, but that is the Remington badge, um, along with the Remington label in a kind of a nice gold color this thing is in very good shape this particular model was built in 1921 according to its serial number and it is a very late example of a number 10. i don't remember if there's a number 11 in there but it was definitely superseded by the number 12 which looked pretty similar but had the sides closed in and things like that that made it more modern for the time I prefer this older, more open style. Um, it's far more interesting to me. Now this section in here, see this kind of big metal plate that has all the type slugs in there? This is called a slotted segment. If you think about it, it's just a piece of metal that had a bunch of slots cut into it. And then the type bars were inserted. So that tips you off that this is a late model. Because originally the number 10 basically had each type bar was held in by, you could think of it like a little joint or hinge screwed into a plate. And so that'd be kind of up and down and, and kind of a jumbled looking, but very old fashioned, very retro looking. I was actually disappointed to find that my number 10 had this, but it actually makes it a little more rare. So it has all sorts of wheels and features and, and everything does something. So of course you can manually advance the platen um, let's say you need to pull a piece of paper out. This releases the paper so you can just rip it out and crumple it up, um, just like in the movies. Um, this is somewhat unusual for um, what you're probably used to typewriters. You usually think of the little advanced lever over here. On this one it's a thumb lever for your right hand. And that advances to the next line as well. These things are just, just delightful. And they're all, it, it functions under tension. See this here? There's a big spring in here, and then there's a, what's most likely cotton cord that pulls the machine over. So it's always under tension, so when you release, when you hit anything that causes it to, to kick over, it starts moving it over. This section back here is how you get your tabs to work. So each one of these little divots is, a, is basically a section where a, 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 a letter or something can be typed. And you just take these metal kludgy looking things and you move them to where you want your tabs to be and they're each numbered. So that's number five, four, two, three, and one. And you can go out of order. And they correspond with these guys. And these are rubberized. These are glass keys. These are rubberized keys, which is interesting. These are some suggestions of what each one should be in terms of letters or whatnot. 
I have rearranged them a little bit for the sake of my own letters because I have a kind of a three level heading I do. So now I'll push it over. And so now I'm going to push the number one. And you're going to see a little finger is going to come out that corresponds with the level of number one. See how number one's little nubbin is up near the top? Number twos is a little lower. Number threes is a little lower. And number fours is a little lower. And number five is way at the bottom. That corresponds to the little finger that's going to kick out. So number one. See that? Caught it. Now we'll do number three because it's actually next. Now we're a little close, so I have to get a little help. Number two. Now it usually works best when you start from a clean space. We'll just do number five at the end. And if you hit an another one, it'll just slide to the end because there's no more nubbins. But that's how it works. It actually works really well. And usually the way I've set it up is you're not hitting a tab unless you're at a new line, so it has enough room to move. It's actually good that, in my mind, that the uh, tension isn't quite hefty enough to slam it through each one because it will help preserve this mechanism from, from damage. Down here you see one of the um, ribbon, uh, not roller isn't the right term, but where the ribbon comes from or goes to. This mechanism, as you go through ribbon, it will actually, it'll advance, it inches along. Once you hit, you know, once you fill up one and the other one's running low and empty, um, it, it can detect that because tension builds and then it will end up switching it back in the opposite direction. You can also see the bell and the little uh, hammer that hits it. Typewriters are, in many ways, very complex. I do. Now, if you want to manually advance the ribbon, you can turn this little that little uh, lever right there, which is fun. And when you push it in or pull it out, it switches to the other side. So as you switch from direction, it kicks in and out. Maybe the back view. It has all sorts of, this is a, a weighted device part of its moving mechanism. Some of it's kind of a mystery to me just because of how complex these machines are. And I'm not sure how well the lighting is. Now, where did I find the serial number? Ah, here we go. Hidden right there. Now, if you get, get into typewriters, you want to go for some, someone probably older than this because they're usually more decorated. They started to cheapen up as time went on. Older ones will have pin, you know, golden pinstriping all over them, which is handy. So now we're gonna show some typing, and we're also going to show kind of how I write letters. And that's why this is a good Christmas time video. I don't know if it'll get to you in time for Christmas, because this is the time of year when even people who don't write things might decide to write something, whether it be a Christmas card, or a full-on letter, and I think this is a very charming way to do it. Uh, the results are very unique and emblematic of a typewriter. It stands out. We'll also, I'll also show you some other things I do, which includes wax sealing. So we'll do a, a, a fun little letter in just a second here. I also forgot to mention this helps you change the color of what you're typing. You have black, red, if you have a bicolor ribbon. I don't, so as you can see, you can see it's mainly been typing up near the top of the ribbon. There's more wear there. That's because that's where black would be. If you switch it to red, it will type near the lower half of the, the ribbon, which would be red. Now, if you switch it up to white, and you have to actually do move this catch over, that isn't white ink, that is stencil. So what stencil does is it doesn't even, 
the ribbon won't even come up. And that is because if you wanted to make multiple copies of something, there was, you took basically a wax paper, you ran it through typed up your message in stencil mode. The typefaces basically broke out the shapes of themselves in the wax paper. You took it out, cleaned it up, got the fragments off, and you put it on essentially an old copier, which would be a kind of a drum with a, a pad with ink that could come through. You put it over that section and you rolled it and it fed paper in, made an imprint allowing ink to flow through the letters you just created onto pieces of paper and you made copies. That's how it worked. Um, ingenious, in a way. I don't remember how long those stencils would last in that scenario before you had to make a new one, but that was an early way to make copies of things. So that's what stencil mode is. Um, you can, I think you can still get stent, you know, the paper that might work for that. And if you get an antique copier, I can't remember the name of them, then, then you're good to go. This is, well, these, this and this are part of your margin sets. So this one is the margin that will initially um, catch. So you pull it over. So as you can see, this is the far margin over here on the left side. If you need to go past that, if you push this and then push it farther, which is kind of a two-hander job, let's see if I can do that. It lets you go past. Then you're gonna start running into either the mechanical limits, which in this case, there's kind of a, this wheel hold, this holder here for the paper is in the way, or this can be your far limit. So you can set this for your standard margin, and this if you need to type outside of it. It's more useful at the end because I'm going to use the release. The bell will hit beforehand. It'll give you get you to the end. And then let's say you have a couple letters you want to do to finish up your word. Well, you can hit that, type away a few times, and then you're good. Um, either that or you can hit it, hit a hyphen, move to the next line. So let's see some typing and show you how I make one of my letters to my loved ones and friends. All right, so you're gonna write a letter. Well, first thing you need is some paper. And for a letter like this on a typewriter, you wanna get something a little better than your plain white copy paper. But this will do for demonstration purposes. I like to use a resume paper, something with a little bit of a texture and a pattern. This is some chintzy stuff you can get, which is fine. Now. Sometimes people respond to you in letters where they just kind of pick up the conversation where you left it. But who knows how long it's been since you read that letter. So we're gonna make a copy. So what you do is you take your paper, then you grab a piece of carbon paper. Now you can use those like um, three sheet, white, pink, yellow carbon copy things that aren't really carbon paper. But if you wanna use your own paper, instead of that generic stuff, you need to use something like this. This is basically a sheet of paper that has a layer of carbon on it. And you can see I've used it. So when you take your paper, you put it back to back, and then this side, then you sandwich another piece of paper on it. So when you roll this through, this, the, the type slug is going to hit this paper with the ribbon it's gonna make the letter. It's going to impact on this and press this carbon into the second page, which is going to make a copy. Now remember, you need to put it in kind of backwards because it's gonna roll up to you like that. So we're going to do that here. And I'm at an awkward angle, so forgive me if it's not the best view, or if I make some goofy mistakes. All right, so we've fed in. So now we'll go to, do, 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 do. that's one of my tabs. We'll just go down a few more because we'll skip the heading and I don't do a tab for the first typing point, which is five spaces in, one, two, three, four, five. And so now let's type a little bit of gibberish.
I'll make a bunch of spelling mistakes for you. I am better typer than this, but I'm also standing, so. Now, there's something you probably noticed on the exclamation point. I had to do a multi, kind of a multi-step thing. So, looking at this keyboard, you'll notice there's a couple things missing, but they're not. There's a number one, and there's no exclamation point. That's because there's no point in adding another key when you already have the key. What do I mean? So number one is L. See? That's number one. So we don't need an extra key for that. An exclamation point is a combination of two characters. So what you're going to have to do is going to hold shift, which is going to prevent the carriage from moving. You're going to hit a period. And then you're going to hit an apostrophe, which in this case is shift eight. And now you have an exclamation point. See, it's little things like that. There is a backspace, but it just makes you go backwards. Now, if you need to strike something out, you can use an X, um, and that more or less covers it up. You can also do just a slash if you're okay with them seeing it, especially if you're doing it for comedic effect. Um, it's really not that bad. Once you get used to it, and some people like, people like seeing the mistakes, it, it gives it a charming feel. So, don't feel bad about that. There's no caps lock, but there's a shift lock. So when you do, it sometimes doesn't like to catch. But once it catches, it's just constantly shifted. So there's, there's no distinction between numbers and letters. It's just you're, you've shifted everything. Why is it called shift? It literally moves up because on the typefaces, there's an upper portion and a lower portion of the slug. And when you look at them, if you were to shift the, the carriage up, it then hits the other um, symbol. Some other later typewriters would have the basket, so all these things shift down, which does the same thing. But this uses an old-fashioned carriage shift, which means with your finger, you're moving the entire weight of that up, which is not that bad. Speaking of finger movement, look how far down you have to, t to press. Okay, look look at the difference there. In order to do that. And it's not a gentle press. You can't just like lightly type uh, like we do on a modern keyboard. You give it some oomph. And you don't have to press all the way down. Floor typing, bottom typing. You hit it with enough oomph and momentum keeps it going. It does the job for you. So bottom typing isn't a necessity. And if you look, these are pretty clean. You know, these this is nice looking typeface. I, I do enjoy these things quite a bit. So we've made our bad letter. Let's see the copy. See? It does it. It's a little faint, and it gets more faint as you wear, run through this more. But it does it. Typewriters are fun. They're classy on a desk at work. They are just great. It's on a felt pad to reduce noise a little bit and give it some more support. The rubber feet are a bit hard, so I like to give it a little something extra padding. Underneath the keys, there is an old leather pad, which is a bit worn out, but it's doing its job for now. This could be more under the middle. There you go. You can see edges of it there. Rolling down. Um, does the job. This is a fun thing to have. And I recommend if you find something like this in good shape, get it. There are typewriter repair shops still around because they've actually had an upswing in popularity. Now let's take our letter and, well, let's kind of get down to the bottom. And we'll do a signature line, which I think I did as that one. So now we'll do, give ourselves a line to write on, which should be,
Shift 6. Yeah, there we go. And now we're going to pull it off, which is using this to release that. And, well, this is kind of a two-hander thing. And there you go. So we have our letter. So now we got to sign it. So we take our original that's going to the person, our carbon paper off to the side, our copy, which turned out readable enough just for your own records, and our extra paper. And get that out of the way. Um, normally you'll want to put some, like if this is a textured plastic um, table, you'll want to use some sort of a, a good, better writing pad if you're going to, you know, actually write something. And you take a pen and you sign your name. See, that's why it's bad. Okay, so we get our name on there, and now we need to seal it. How do we do that? So you take your seal, which you have made from nostalgic impressions, finding your family coat of arms and motto, and had them make a seal for you. You've also gotten some of their semi-supple wax, because this is going to be inside an envelope, so it's going to be safe and sound. So you can use a wax that's a little brittle, but has some supple material in it, because it looks nicer. And you're going to need a lighter. So what we're going to do is get it lit. And sometimes these are a little finicky. And we're going to drip the wax onto where we're signing. I like to sign. I like to uh, seal right at the end of my signature. And this, these sometimes Need a little bit of coaxing. All right, we've dripped about enough wax. You take your stamp, you want to breathe on it, give it a layer of moisture, and press it down. And give it maybe a couple seconds one, two, three, four, five. And we're going to pull it off. I put a little. Um, mark at the top of mine to show where how it's oriented up and down. Of course, I'm not at a good angle to see. And now that we've done that, we have our coat of arms sealed in wax. Another thing you can do is get a little bit of an ink and dab this in that, like a gold ink. And when you press it, all the parts that are in the background will be golden. So that's another thing you can do. Yes, this should survive the mailing system pretty well when it's inside. But what do you do for the envelope? The envelope calls for a cheaper wax. Um, you can probably find some better looking stuff than this, but something that's very supple, very rubbery, and will survive the modern mechanized postal system. What do you do for that? Well, we need to break this down because we, we could kind of light this with a lighter and drip it, but because of the amount, I like to cut off the amount I'm going to need. You don't want to just crunch it because then this will go flying. So now we have our chunk. We're going to need our melting spoon. You can also substitute your, your drug spoon, um, heroin, meth, or whatever it is that uses a spoon. I'm sure, they'll be just fine. Um, because I know all of you are just complete drug users, apparently. And we're going to fold this up. I don't want to waste an envelope. So we're going to fold it up like it's an envelope. By the way, if you're handing this to somebody and um, you want to make it into its own letter, its own envelope, you can do that. And you can use a brittle wax, which will break when you open it, just like the, just like the old you know, it's, it's sealed with wax type of stuff, you can do that. Um, this wax will not do that, so you just rip the paper open. But you can get brittle wax if you're hand delivering. It will not survive the postal system. So now, we light this. And we're gonna use that flame to slowly melt this wax. And I'll come back once it's all melted, because it, 
it's going to take a bit. Now once your wax is all melted, and ours seems to be, seems all goopy in there, we'll pour it down on the letter. And this wax, you'll notice every wax kind of has its own little temperament. This one's a little more, this is a lot more forgiving than the nicer waxes, which makes it a good wax to learn with. Yeah. Another breath, and press it down. And one, two, three, four, five. This one you can also let it sit longer because it doesn't stick as much to the metal. There we go. I actually use a separate different seal for my the outside of my letters. But um, you know, you don't need to have tons and tons of seals. So there you go. And make sure to, of course, blow out your candle. Never leave an open flame unattended. If you're interested in what um, cheap wax I used, uh, the, 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 the box is a bit beat up. This is called Vintage Seal Wax from, I think, uh, got wax over it. Uni-Q, unique, o o o o dot com. I get it from Amazon. It may or may not still be there, but you get a big old pack of it. It's good to practice with because that's a little more of a pastel -y red. I prefer a deeper red, but it's great for the postal system. In case you were wondering what the side of this machine looks like, um, the insides while you're typing, um, here you go. Nothing really back up here, but So that is the Remington number 10. It was definitely a very popular version of the Remington typewriter. The early versions, now I'm going to kind of backtrack, but notice how this has the uh, platen right where you can see it, right? You can see what you're typing. That's what you would expect, right? Early versions actually had it so that this section where you're seeing would actually be pointed down and all the slugs would be swinging up at it. So if you wanted to see what, how you, your progress was, you had to lift it up and look, put it back down, and then keep typing. I kind of want one of those because they're clunky and weird, but it definitely would have been, um, you would have had to been a very good typer to use them. Essentially, blind typing. <laughs> um, but hey, people did that until they figured out this design. I'm not sure why that design was first. Um, was it easier to manufacture? Was it easier to think of? Because this is, I mean... This is quite a complex piece of machinery. Maybe it was just easier to conceive that way. I don't know. Um, this seems like the most logical thing to try to go for. But there you go. Merry Christmas from Rapidly Aging Technology. May your Christmas letters be well received and well liked. And even if this is too late for this year, because of upload speeds and processing time, blah, blah, blah. I, I do hope that maybe next year it will encourage you to do something special with your let letters. Even if you just do cards and don't decide to get, you know, a dust battleship like this, you can get the seals for not too expensive. You can even get fairly inexpensive, you know, monogram style ones that are pre-made. Get yourself a, a cheap wax and a candle and some stuff and your letters will stand out now. Anyway, uh, you have a Merry Christmas, and I hope to see you around. Talk to you later. Bye.